All right. I hope I um, am having uh, my technical difficulties here have subsided. Uh, so if you could let me know in the uh, in the chat if you guys can hear me, um, and we can go ahead and get started here. I attempted to live stream before, but I think I had some audio issues. Um, so um, please feel free to share this stream because I didn't have I didn't give any notice or anything about this stream. So I'm not sure if uh, how many folks would be kind of uh, kind of plugged in right now. Um, but let me see if you can hear me. Please let me know. See if there's a way to share this um, before I complete it. Let's see. I don't think so. But I'll try here. So let me know if you can hear me. If I'm uh, hopefully not muted anymore. Um, let's see here. Is there any way to share this? Share. Oh, there it is. All right. Uh, log in. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to share this really quick here. Um, let's go here. Let me know if you can hear me. All right. Thank you. Hey, Merry Christmas, Derek. I hope you're having a, a great holiday break here. Um, let me see if I can share this really quick. So again, this is a kind of a live stream QA, uh, kind of anything goes here. And I wanted to introduce this book here. So let me see if I can share this on my screen here. Um, let's go switch accounts. All right, one second, sorry, bear with me here. Uh, there we go. Let's see. No, I don't think it's working, but anyways. So um, hope everybody's well. Um, I'm glad, uh, Derek, you're on here. Vacation time is going great. And I have a little bit of uh, vacation time here between uh, Christmas and New Year's. And I have a little bit of a respite here. My wife took uh, the kiddos to a Chuck E. Cheese birthday extravaganza. And I wanted to just pop on and see how everyone's doing, see what you guys uh, are thinking about, what's on your mind. And I wanted to introduce this book that I just came across and, and purchased, um, and, and I've read a little bit of it. It's uh, by Stanyan Dr. Tanev. Uh, it's a forward by um, David Bradshaw, and it's entitled Energy in Orthodox Theology and Physics, From Controversy to Encounter, another one of these you know, kind of strange confluences of, of domains that me and maybe four or five other people are interested in. Um, so not really made for a popular audience, but um, people that are interested in, I'd love to kind of discuss it with you here. Um, and uh, this book really looks at the thinkers, uh, Sergei Bulkakov, uh, George Florovsky, John Meredith, Christos Yanaris, and Thomas Torrance. Um, and it's also obviously uh, focusing on the uh, thought of uh, St. Gregory Palamas. Uh, so I'll read a little bit of the, um, uh, the preface, maybe the introduction, but I really want to know what's on your guys' mind any topic at all you'd want to discuss um, about this, you know, kind of uh, convergence of these two fields or um, anything that's going on in, in your uh, in your world right now. Um, I've been thinking about, you know, delving in more to kind of the uh, cultural issues. I don't know about uh, starting uh, another channel, like a, des a, a different channel, uh, really focusing on uh, kind of cultural issues, um, political issues, you know, contemporary political issues. I don't know if I want to do it on this channel because the one kind of video that I put up wading into this territory was removed and uh, I got a warning. So out of 450 plus uploads, this one where uh, it was entitled the uh, keeping Christ's commandment while wading into the culture war issues. Um, that was the title and that's the, the video that got banned, right? Keeping Christ's commandment to love your neighbor while wading into the cultural war issues. And I think I broke some of uh, YouTube's uh, rules on talking about uh, the coof and the jab and some things that are coming to light now. And it was just, uh, yeah, it was just weird is, is uh, it was removed. And this was after, uh, you know, Elon had purchased Twitter and we saw what was happening there. So it just kind of hit different seeing that video, the first video of mine being removed. But I do have an Odyssey channel. If you want to check it out, um, it was an appearance that I have. I do maybe a weekly or so appearance on David Gronowski's uh, local 
um, radio program, FM and AM, called A Neighbor's Choice. Um, David Gronowski, he's got a video. His channel was removed maybe a year and a half ago uh, from YouTube. Um, he is a recently uh, baptized uh, Orthodox brother who lives close to me here in the Central Florida region. And uh, he's an excellent guy to talk to. He's got a, a, a local radio show, but it's also syndicated. And he's had a lot of great people on from you know, Ron Paul to Jordan Peterson um, and, and many others. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. Um, this is his channel for the sacred and one for the profane. Yeah, that's actually a, a way to put it. Um, what do you think, Derek? You think that's uh, something to do or you think I should just keep it on this one channel or not even just wade in publicly to the cultural war issues because that, uh, you know, could get you in trouble. You know, it can get you in trouble with, you know, your your in real life life uh, with work and, and what have you. Uh, if you, you know, dare to put forth an opinion that isn't, uh, you know, accepted in the uh, in the mainstream, which is a strange, strange time we're we're in here. Derek, I loved your your chat with uh, Mathieu Pagel. Uh, that was kind of my favorite interview of his. Did a great, great job. Um, and if you're listening to this, please check out Derek Fiedler's channel and his uh, recent discussion with Mathieu Pigeot on um, the language of creation and his uh, kind of up and coming work. So um, thank you for that. So you would hate you to lose your orthodox content due to cultural commentary. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and it's with this channel, it's not really, I'm not, you know, I love that people are interested in it and and it's growing. It did actually, there was an algorithm change earlier this year, like, uh, I don't know, maybe March, April, maybe a little later where my channel was growing consistently, um, you know, a few hundred subscribers a month, not crazy, uh, two, 300 subscribers a month. And then it was completely uh, just cut in half. And then that was cut in half as well. So I went from, you know, 300 subscribers a month to maybe 30 to 40. Um, and thank God I, I don't have to, you know, earn a living off this channel here. Uh, you know, I do it just to share kind of what interests me. Um, so I love that it's growing, but it's not necessary. So I can imagine if you had your income tied to this, this platform, how hard it is to navigate, um, the linguistic landscape and the conceptual landscape kind of politically and culturally, um, trying to provide your, you know, genuine opinion or insight into things and have to worry about losing your, uh, your entire income, which is, uh, is, is really unfortunate. I think the tides are changing though. Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, what happened with, with what's happened with Elon and Twitter. Um, I think the censorship and the kind of government, uh, infiltration of all of the other, you know, larger platforms, wh whether it's, uh, Google, uh, Google, YouTube, um, Facebook, I think there's way more happening there. Um, but I think it's, it's not, you know, nothing that's come out so far uh, from the Twitter files, so-called Twitter files, um, has, you know, surprised me at all. Uh, I, and and it, what's maybe not surprised me, but what's remarkable is the, the lack of attention, the mainstream, um, you know, kind of corporate media sources that are not covering it or, you know, they they stayed out of it for weeks and then they kind of were forced to, to um Kind of interact with the story and and they were just like oh this is a nothing burger and nothing to see here and i don't think it's should be surprising to anyone when we see the um the information coming to light that you know the government intel, uh, intelligence agencies have a heavy hand in in censoring and monitoring what goes on on twitter um twitter is uh it's hard to really understand it's something it's a new thing that is Twitter is that which governs the discourse now, which is really, really strange. Um, and I don't think it's so much that the intelligence agencies, you know, infiltrated uh, Twitter. Uh, I think that a lot of these technologies are outgrowths from, you know, DARPA and um, and a lot of uh, military technologies. So they're just at the origin, really intertwined with these uh, with these technologies, especially the social media technologies and. The effects that it's having on society and our psyche and our relationships and the way that we think and organize our thoughts, the way that we relate to each other, the way that we relate to education, and, and it's just profoundly altering and changing things at a rapid speed. Uh, so I, I think it's more uh, that these, even these um, military and intelligence uh and apparatuses are are they're trying to figure it out as well i don't think they have their 
hand on the pulse. I don't think they're kind of in control. There's really nobody in control uh, of this of this kind of domain that's that's emerged. So uh, it's it's interesting, and this is something that kind of type topics like this I'd like to get into, um, you know, and discuss with with folks and, and make some um, make some uh, videos on. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of time to uh, make a lot of videos. You know, I have a full time job, so and I'll go with uh, you know days or weeks uh, or maybe a month even where nothing occurs to me to make a video, and it's it's strange when that how it happened before. I would get worried and and whatnot, but now I just I just know that it's it's not time, um, and you know I'll have a burst of energy to, you know, make you know four or five videos, six videos in a week, um, and then uh, it'll just go away, or it just won't occur to me to uh, make a video on any topic. So I've learned to kind of trust when that happens. I don't know if uh, if you've had any experience like that, Derek, um, but just kind of trust when that happens and and uh, you know and move forward here. So. This by happenstance, I had a little bit of time and I just got this book in here. So I wanted to read through it here. Um, so if uh, if you guys, again, any topics or fair game here, um, there are a couple of chapters here. So I went through in the previous video, uh, I had a, a mute issue. I had a kind of a technical challenge here. So I restarted here. Um, but the book is uh, re relatively re recent, uh, written recently, I think in 2017. Um, and uh, I think it's fascinating in this convergence of theology, orthodox theology with all these different domains is relatively new because of the lack of translation into the Western world of really uh, kind of profound and foundational orthodox theological uh, authors and saints and topics and writers and fathers. So I think it's really interesting to look at the confluence and the convergence of these ideas uh, and that's certainly captured captured my attention. Um, so, see Zen Muppet. Hi, happy Christmas, Merry Christmas to you. Thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in here. Um, and let's see. Maybe I'll read. Uh, so the the introduction. I've already read it, and it really uh, kind of double clicks on this idea of the essence and energies distinction that was really uh, made popularized or brought into the light by Saint Gregory Palamas in uh, the thirteenth. 12th, 13th century, um, but it gets kind of deep into the weeds. I don't know how many people would be kind of interested in, and uh, I think it's important though to really look at this distinction between God's uh, divine essence and divine energies. Um, so maybe I can read a little bit from the introduction here. Actually, let me do the preface because it's a little bit shorter. So again, the book is Energy and Orthodox Theology and Physics. And uh, the preface uh, goes like this. It says, I've never been satisfied with textbook definitions of energy and physics, either during the time of my master's and PhD studies, nor during my years as a professor of physics. Again, uh, this is written by Dr. Stoyan Tanav. He's associate professor of technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation at Carleton University, Ottawa, Canada, adjunct professor in the faculty of theology at Sofia University, Bulgaria, he holds a PhD in physics from the University Pierre de Marie Curie and a PhD in systematic theology from Sofia University. So continuing on, he says, um, most of these definitions tend to adopt an instrumentalist approach to its meaning in terms of energy and physics, thus avoiding the discussion of any physical reality behind the concepts. I think that is right on. As it appears, many physicists, including uh, many great ones, do not seem to appreciate what they would call philosophical questions. Yet the concept of energy has a fundamental place in physics. I found some comfort in the fact that other physicists have also struggled with its definition. According to Eugene Hecht, the concept of energy, quote, influences our thinking about every branch of physics, indeed about every aspect of our existence. Yet there is no completely satisfactory definition of energy. Even so, he, uh, he continues, we will quantify its various manifestations as we struggle to define it. And that is what I have been doing, struggling to find a more meaningful definition of energy and continuously looking for ideas and contexts that could help for a better articulation of the concept. The opportunity to explore further the concept of energy came from within the realm of Christian theology and more specifically Eastern Christian Orthodox theology. 
It was exactly 20 years ago when I realized that the concept has had a fundamental role in Byzantine and contemporary Orthodox theology. It goes right to the heart of Orthodox theology and affects the whole body of Christian doctrine. According to Vladimir Lossky, quote, wholly unknowable in his essence, God wholly reveals himself in his energies. The doctrine of the energies, ineffably distinct from the essence, is the dogmatic basis of the real character of all mystical experience. Oh, that was great. Let me read that again from Vladimir Lossky. Holy, holy unknowable in his essence, so God, holy unknowable in his essence, reveals himself in his energies. The doctrine of the energies, ineffably distinct from the essence, is the dogmatic basis of the real character of all mystical experiences. And this speaks to the nature of the debate between Barlam and St. Gregory Palamas in the 13th, 12th century. The real central question was the knowability or unknowability of God. And Barlam was a uh, critic of the Hesychast um, the Hesychast movement or the Hesychast tradition where uh, the monks would, you know, go into their cell and they would con continuously pray and focus on um, the Jesus prayer or their breath and do work uh, on the monastery. And they would experience that we have these moments of experience of, of um, you know, of the divine presence or the divine light. And the question was, is this a real experience that is related or connected to God in any way. And uh, I think St. Gregory Palamas obviously won that debate and it kind of became part of the tradition. Let's see here. Let me continue here. So um, again, this is the real character of all mystical experience, according to Lasky here. This was a striking message for me, the author continues. First, it makes a whole lot of sense for a physicist who said who was systematically trained that the only way to explore invisible physical realities is by enabling the energetic manifestations of their inner structure second in turn it turns upside down the dominant understanding of religion as the adoption of a coherent system of obligatory beliefs associated with specific institutions and rituals concerning a supernatural god who governs the world as a kind of natural law having little to do with relating to human beings in a personal manner. Third, it puts the question of God into an epistemological context by emphasizing that he can actually be known. Quote, God wholly reveals himself in his energies. Close quote. I felt that this is a critically important message, but what were the Holy Fathers telling me? What type of knowledge were they talking about? How does this knowledge relate to the words of the Lord in the Gospel of John 17.3 and Quote, and this is eternal life, that they know you, uh, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom have sent you. Close quote. What do I need to do in order to become part of such a revelation? What did the fathers mean by using the term energy, and what does it mean in the context of Orthodox theology? How do others understand the above statement? I'd be interested to hear what you think here in the chat about this this uh, quote from John, right? And quote, I'll say it again. And this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Having struggled for a long time with the meaning of energy in physics, do I have an advantage in understanding the message of the church fathers? Searching for answers to the questions above was the reason for me to start a parallel study of the concept of energy in Orthodox theology and physics. And I've been greatly encouraged by my spiritual father and first theology teacher at St. Paul University in Ottawa, Canada, Father Maxim Lysik, the parish priest of Christ the Savior Orthodox Cathedral in Ottawa, quote, you are a physicist and you should search for these answers by studying theology and exploring the theological insights of the church fathers, close quote. I must emphasize, therefore, that this exploration for me has been, before everything, theological. And he puts a uh, hyphen between theological. The comparison with physics was not what I have been looking for, but part of the way I have, but part of the way I have been looking. I've not tried to use physics to explain theology or the other way around. I've tried to see how theology and physics struggle in articulating the challenge of knowing in their own way. 
In articulating and comparing these challenges, I did find my own way to the dialogue between theology and physics. In both cases, the challenges have been associated with controversies. It is similarity of the challenges and the controversies that offers a way to encounter the of theology of physics, and hence the subtitle of the present book. Let's see here in the chat here, Derek says, so good. I was just writing out my, uh, my arrival film analysis by Luis and the linguist and uh, the Ian of physicist unifying over the course of the story. Yeah, very cool. cool. I'd love to see it. Um, all right, back to the text here. I'm grateful for Father Maxim as well as for George Dragas, Father Maxim's theology professor and teacher from the Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston, Massachusetts, um, whom I had the blessing of having as a teacher myself at the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec, Canada. For their guidance, encouragement, and wisdom, my deepest gratitude goes for their. Uh, my deepest gratitude goes also to John Hygienosalo, the director of Orthodox theology program at the Montreal campus of University of Sherbrooke, and so forth and so on. So um, the, the rest is just uh, kind of thinking and thanking uh, a lot of people that that helped him uh, kind of come up to this this uh, come up to this topic with this book here. Um, let me show them here. So I would start with the assumption that the definition of energy in both fields are not really similar. I think that's the uh, the standard. Um, I think that's the kind of the standard interpretation or understanding. So I think putting these these, and I think it's a good point putting these two disparate domains in dialogue, uh, starting from that assumption and then working kind of your way from there is kind of a, the best way to go about it. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the. Um, some of the chapters and some of the sections here. And we're going to let me know which ones, you know, sound interesting to you. There's one here that I may be kind of uh, going to dial in here, here. So let me see if I can find the one that I was looking for. So part one is entitled Divine Essence Energy in the Sophiological Controversy. Uh, chapter one is George Father George Florovsky and the rediscovery of the distinction between divine essence and energies in modern Orthodox theology. Chapter two is Energia versus Sophia in the works of Sergius Bulgakov. Chapter three, Energia versus Sophia in the works of George Florovsky. Chapter four, Father John Meyerdorf in Divine Sophia and Energia in 14th and 20th century Orthodox theology. Part two of the book is the encounter between theology and physics. Chapter five is the possible grounds for a parallel study of energy in orthodox theology and physics. Chapter six, the concepts of energy in physics. Chapter seven, the theology of St. Gregory Palamax, Palamas in the context of the encounter between theology and physics. Chapter eight, the language of orthodox theology and quantum mechanics. I'm going to kind of zoom in on this one here and see what it kind of comes about. Chapter 148. Page 148. Let's see what's going on here. And hopefully we can make sense of this chapter since we obviously didn't read the chapters before, but let's see what it uh, what it looks like. And again, anything anything in the chat or any questions or topics, this is kind of open. Um, I'd love to know what uh, what's on your guys' mind here. Here it is, chapter eight, the language of orthodox theology, which made me think of obviously the, the language of creation, right? Uh, theology and Quantum Mechanics, St. Gregory Palamas and Niels Bohr. So putting St. Gregory and Palamas in dialogue with Niels Bohr uh, makes me giddy. So it uh, shows you kind of a, how much of a nerd I am. Uh, so let's see here. Introduction of this chapter. The terminological or linguistic aspects of Orthodox theology are highly relevant within the context of postmodernity, which is posing challenges to both the mission of the Orthodox Church today and her attitude towards scientific progress in general. Christos Yanaris points out that one of the key characteristics of postmodernity is the emergence of a new language in dealing with ontology and reality, a language emerging from two different scientific disciplines, quantum mechanics and post-Freudian psychology. Christos Yanaris sees the postmodern duty of the church in the creative appropriation and not simply adoption of this new language aiming at linking the salvific message of the gospel to linguistic categories that could be more efficient in the interpretation of, quote, the reality of existence, the appearance and disclosure of being. 
and more specifically in the articulation of the experimental mode of the relationship between God, world, and man. According to Yanaris, such appropriation could become the source of a new proposal coming from the church to deal with postmodernity and not just to modernize itself. Make sure this was written in 2017. I think it'd be important to get this date here. So yeah, this was first published in 2017. So if you think about what's happened in uh, our world since 2017, right? You think from the Jordan Peterson perspective, he was just coming out um, a little bit before that actually against Bill C-16 in Canada. We saw what was emerging at the Evergreen College through the work of um, um, of Benjamin Boyce. Uh, we saw the firing of of um, Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying, and we saw kind of the struggle section session that they were put into, uh, right? And I remember at that time thinking all this topic would come up about what was going on in Evergreen or the kind of the the, the pronoun debate in the university. And every time it came up, I thought it was just uh, you know superfluous or you know I thought it was something that was relegated to the university and to specific niches uh, within the university in the postmodern uh, liberal arts and humanities. But we have seen that since spill out into a world at such a rapid and, and uh, you know, and in a uh, large extent, it's really quite dizzying um, in all different areas, right? This used to be, you know, critical race theory, critical theory was relegated to kind of the education department and to kind of legal theory. Um, and a lot of these neologisms or this new playing with words and language um, has really burst into our social cultural discourse, right? Where now we have these neo pronouns and pronouns and they are given a demarcation, an ontological demarcation. Let's say someone is um, a they or a them, they're a single person and they say, hey, I don't feel like a a boy or a girl. So instead of saying, hey, there is a spectrum, there are tendencies, masculine and feminine tendencies, but there, there is a fluidity there. Some people are more masculine in some certain areas, whether or not they're you know male or female, right? And there is a spectrum there, but it usually, you can think of it as a kind of a personality type, but right, whatnot. But through this postmodern linguistic manipulation, these, these categories uh, or these pronouns have been giving a sort of ontological uh, uh, kind of construction of personalities. And we've seen just the explosion of, uh, you know, from TikTok and, and on social media, especially since the, the pandemic, an explosion of what looks like to me, and I don't mean to be in a, a derogatory sense, a just a, a proliferation of, of mental confusion. Um, and that's leading to the, um, you know, the altering, the altering of kids' bodies, their sexual uh, reproductive possibilities, uh, their identities at the mo time when you're most confused about who and what you are, right? That time right before puberty and as pu puberty hits, you're told through this amplification of social media uh, kind of propaganda that, you know, there there's a binary out there and that the binary of, of um, male and female is oppressive and that in order to extricate yourself from that binary. It's important to look within and see in who you really are, what your lived experiences. And from there, here are some pronouns that you can use to attach some labels to how you feel in a particular moment. And that those labels must be recognized by others to the uh, point where, you know, something like dead maiming in, uh, on, in Twitter was, a you know, uh, an event that would get you kicked off, right? And these things just seemingly uh, accepted into the cultural discourse as as the norm, um, but these ideas, especially with you know, and I'm going to find a tangent here. Essentially, this idea of gender theory is really a modern uh, or a postmodern uh, kind of uh, manifestation. Uh, it's really situated in the work of of John Money in the 1950s and 60s, and I've done uh, some research into the origin of of you know pronouns and and these type of um, these type of ideas and how the uh, definition of something like gender uh, dysphoria it changed from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5. And what that's done from a, a medical lens to look at these psychological problems has really profoundly changed. We have something like, you know, gender affirming care, which says that, you know, it's not appropriate for a psychologist or a, you know, medical profession professional to question the feelings that a a child is having. And, you know, I don't know. This is what it seems is happening. 
what I haven't really come across is, is the actual data. I know there's been a massive explosion of, of, um, of these types of personalities and these types of use of pronouns and the, the, uh, the exploration of uh, transitioning. They've gone up 500, 1,000%. Um, and we see people like, you know, Matt Walsh and others talk about, you know, through his book or through his, uh, his movie, what does a woman talk about this happening, right? And this medication that's used to castrate uh, sex offenders, Lupron was given in mass to, to children in order to stop um, um, puberty from happening. You know, it's something that's manifesting in the world. I want to see where it's happening the most and to what extent. Uh, it's proliferating. I know it's, it's extremely exponentially going, uh, you know, kind of moving forward. And it's difficult to have the conversation because if depending on what part of the political spectrum you fall on, um, you know, it's hard to have that conversation because if someone has battling with gender dysphoria and really feels uh, dysphoric about the way that they feel about their gender, these people need compassion and care and the right medical and psychological attention. And anytime you're, I'm speaking with someone that's, let's say, on the on the on the left or or far left, and um, I say that hey, there, it's not about you know those people. That's very small. I think half percent of of, uh, of of the population, half of one percent, have these genuine feelings of of gender dysphoria. It's the proliferation through social media and this kind of social contagion that we see um, that's exponentially increasing this problem. So. If this is a DSM-5 diagnostic mental complex, right, gender dysphoria, and we're seeing it proliferate and exponentially increase, especially in young girls, uh, but also in young boys, the question is, why is that happening? And it seems like there's been a switch from looking at this as a sort of, you know, uh, a me in a mental um, distress context to a more, you know, essential identity of who or what that person really is. Right, that's where the switches happen. So when we're talking about the, you know, the the um, exponential proliferation of of the trans phenomenon, um, the question is, what is what is the nature of this phenomenon, and how did it switch from something that needs to be treated and managed with compassion to something that needs to be affirmed at all costs, and how does that being completely accepted by the medical community uh, and kind of the the general cultural discourse. Uh, in general, how is that happening? I feel it's really bizarre, and I think it's just uh, it's part of this kind of fragmentation that we've been seeing uh, happening kind of across the board here. So.